Released by Fully Ramblematic in 2007 on the PC, Six Days of Sacrifice would be the fourth game of the Jizo Mythos series. Written and directed by creator Ben Croshaw, also known as Yahtzee the Zero Punctuation Review series, the game would take place in between the third and second game, but conclude the overall storyline. For story, the game features a city worker named Theodore de Cobb as he is trapped in an underground lab with four others, but sees he is a pawn in a greater game. For gameplay, controls will return to point-and-click style for exploring and interacting with the environment alongside solving puzzles. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, we are reminded how in 1993 the body of John Defoe is destroyed, and in the year 2385 his soul is destroyed, but the final step to opening the bridge to allowing the pain elemental Chizo into this world will be destroying his mind. 196 years between each event, it is now the year 2189, as we see the headquarters for Ophthalmology, a fast-growing religion that combines elements of every religion prior and is very popular with the public and celebrities. A city council inspector named Theodore de Cobb is assigned to inspect the building for unauthorized construction, but a red-robed man named Garriott shoves him down an empty elevator shaft to silence him. On July 24, Theo wakes up barely alive and under the care of Dr. Samantha Hardy, who is arguing with a gentleman in a trilby who demands they both stay there and stay quiet until his employer arrives. As the hat man stands guard, something is banging against the other door, and as Theo manages to pickpocket a password off the guard, he helps the doctor hide as they open the opposite door. Surprisingly, a tall, pale man is beyond the door, encroaching on the hat man and killing him quickly before leaving. While Theo does want to escape, he also wants to know what is going on. Dr. Hardy explains the elevator shaft he fell all the way down in brought him to this underground laboratory complex. Ophthalmology itself is just a front for the true organization, the Order of Blessed Agonies. Either way, Theo knows this underground lab definitely did not receive a permit, and Samantha suggests he speaks to another prisoner like them named Janine for more answers. For now, they need to focus on escaping, and she thinks taking the cultists down here hostage will help with that plan. He finds Janine, who hands them weapons they can use, but also mentions she is too afraid to face a certain man. Moving to confront a cultist named Canning, Canning notes Samantha used to work for them and locked her up for refusing to listen to them. As they take him hostage, the hat man stops them outside and quickly reverses the situation, but then the lights cut out and soon another man in red, calling himself the caretaker and guide, knocks out both Canning and the hat man. He advises Samantha and Theo to hide and avoid roaming this place at night, and going back to Janine, it turns out she was the one who tipped off the police that there was a strange facility here, but is discouraged to see they only sent one city planner to investigate. Otherwise, Janine is a freelance journalist who was snooping around the success of the headquarters and was captured and imprisoned. Samantha chooses to not talk about what she was working on down here, and instead shares Canning is just a low-level acolyte working for a man named Garriott, who himself is a servant to someone they call the Prince. Janine notes the Hat Man is just a mercenary who dresses like Trilby, the legendary gentleman thief character from various horror movies like The Defoe Manor Murders and Hotel Horror, though many believe he is based on an actual person from the 20th century. For now, it's getting late, they turn in for the night. The next day, Theo explores the adjacent room, finding a small child who tears off his face to reveal a welding mask, and he does the same, only to wake up from this nightmare. Samantha goes over their new plan to escape, as Canning is basically trapped down here too, and so they will attempt again to take him hostage. The Hatman is guarding Canning's room this time, and after leading him through a storage area with the corpse of a man named Lengthen within, a strange disturbance has the tall man appear again, seize the Hatman, and tear him apart. Unsure why the monster is focusing on the hat man, Theo hobbles back to Samantha as the hallway seems to shift noticeably, and together they hold up Canning again. Unafraid, he submits to their capture, and while they press him for answers on means to leave, he reveals there is the elevator that even he does not control, and the hub behind a few security locks. He refuses to talk more, and as an acolyte of pain, doubts there is anything they can do to him to force him to talk. Canning tries to sow seeds of discord within Theo, reminding him how little he understands about all of this, people like Samantha, or the tall man whom they call the Prince. Figuring out the security locks on their own, they see the hub is completely dark and Samantha offers to go out first. After waiting a bit, Theo thinks to follow in, but just then the doctor comes out, clutching her throat that has been slashed open as she falls dead at their feet. Fearing that they're all going to die down here, Janine begins to let panic seep in more than it already has, leaving the room and the caretaker warns him not to wander while the prince is about, putting him to sleep. The next day, Theo feels they need to figure out what's in the hub as it's still their only way out. Walking out, he is shocked to see another hat man who seems a little confused on where he is and vaguely remembers that he was once dead. He shares his name is Trilby, and knows he was once named after the famous cat burglar. Everything else is a familiar blur, such as John Defoe and the sights of the two incidents. 
Seeing he's not a threat, Theo suggests they take a look around to help figure things out, and the two split up as the hallway becomes more dungeon-like. Entering a previously locked room, they discover a room full of tubes that Trilby remembers coming out of, and seeing more of the picture now, Theo returns to Canning. Canning is non-specific when answering questions about John Defoe, but he does confirm one thing, that Samantha was here as a cloner, making clones specifically of Trilby, which explains why there are multiples of him even when it seems he dies. He suggests showing him Samantha's face to jog Trilby's memory, and while he wants to avoid showing Trilby Samantha's dead face, he looks for her ID card, but Janine has it. She not only refuses to leave her locked room until whatever is in the hub is figured out, she strangely feels the transformation of the lab hallway is something natural. Activating the security camera, Theo finds the remains of a ruined building are inside the hub, and reassures Janine. Borrowing Samantha's ID card, Trilby looks at Samantha's name and face, and suddenly memories of when Phil Hardy was killed by a possessed Trilby at Defoe Manor come back to haunt him. Coming back to his senses, he thanks Theo and agrees to help him investigate more. However, Janine panics again when seeing Trilby, as he was the one she feared, but for some reason cannot explain why. Regardless, they need to work together and so reopen the door to the hub. Oddly, the door doesn't open, and checking, the fuse is blown, though as soon as Theo fixes it and returns, Janine already went into the hub on her own. Within, they see two more Trilby clones standing outside the door, though not with any intention of blocking them. To this, Trilby asks if they are all clones, and thinking that makes the most sense given his time displacement, they continue on. Entering, they find themselves in the Defoe Manor, but Theo knows these aren't the ruins he saw on the camera. Trilby explains this is where John Defoe lived and where he destroyed him, but as Janine replies that she thought that was all just a movie, the tall man briefly appears behind Trilby to snap his neck and take him away. Soon after, John Defoe comes out too, and just in time, both Theo and Janine are sent back outside the hub. The caretaker appears before him, explaining that what he just saw was Defoe Manor, where John Defoe's mind and body remained. Trilby thought when it was burned down he destroyed both, but the mind still lingered with the ruins after the body was gone. The Order built this entire facility around the ruins to contain it, and cloning Trilby was needed because John Defoe fears the man that exercised him. Because of this, Trilby unknowingly became immune to Defoe's influence, and hence why the Order surrounded the hub with Trilby's, so John Defoe could never wander out and infect others. Unfortunately, the tall man is the head of the Order, and keeps killing the Trilbys, and for each one that dies, the more Defoe's influence spreads. They see this firsthand as the halls become more obscure, and the tall man now turns his attention to them. Janine oddly states she doesn't even remember going into the hub, and cannot shake the sensation that something is trying to take her over. Overcome by nerves, Janine rushes to be comforted by Theo, who embraces her, and in the moment the two spend a passionate night together, temporarily forgetting the nightmare closing in around them. The next day, Theo wakes from a nightmare of butchering Canning, but when he goes to check on him, finds he actually has been slaughtered. Stepping out, the shifting of the room is stronger, and suddenly he sees Janine pursuing him with a welding mask and blood splattered on her. Finding a strange door it leads to a stranger's shed with a pickaxe within it, and with it, he limps to the manor's kitchen and lures the possessed journalist closer. He opens the hole, but to his surprise, the tall man lunges out, stabbing Janine and pulls her through, killing her as reality snaps back to normal except for the fresh blood trickle on the wall. Now the only survivor remaining, a defeated Theo, slumps down against the wall. The next day, we jump ahead to February 3rd, 2386, where we see a man, dubbed the Mephistopheles Killer, is imprisoned on the charge of killing Dr. Jonathan Somerset and taking his place, whereas the imposter he killed all of the other crewmates. It turns out he is Malcolm Somerset, the only son of Jonathan Somerset, yet they cannot figure out the motive or psychology behind the garish and creative kills committed. Malcolm is visited by the caretaker, who is also the one who influenced him to kill his father in the first place, and tells him he is here to help free him and this will be the last time they see each other. Malcolm is bitter at being framed and jailed for six months, but at this time, a strange parcel is delivered to his cell, and within is a strange blade-like key that also seems like a sacrificial knife. Behind his cell is a fleshy door, and as he cuts the throat of it open, he descends the bloody stairwell, experiencing a flashback of every death back on the ship, only now he is the one who did it. With each murder, more of his hair is shaved off, and more of his prison garb is slashed and soaked red with blood. Exiting into a strange flush tunnel, he now appears exactly as the caretaker, and spots a very old man bound to a wall. The old man speaks up, and shares he is Trilby, but doubts he is the original one, and Chizou will not allow him to die feeding on his pain. He was the Trilby that sent the idol and box into space, and notes Malcolm was the one to find and open it. As they talk, Trilby explains Chizo is a pain elemental, coming from the universe of magic and the last of its kind. His power makes him the closest thing to a god of pain, and he makes a request of Malcolm to use the knife called Freehorn's Blade to kill him as it's filled with Chizo's magic and is the only thing that can free him. 
If he runs him through the heart with it, Malcolm will be infused with Trilby's life energy, and Trilby wants him to give it to someone in need nearby. Complying with his wish, he ends the suffering of the trapped Trilby, and nearby, Malcolm spots a dying Trilby from the events of Trilby's notes, and resurrects him with the life force of the clone. From this, Jizo itself now stirs, and looking to leave, Malcolm finds the way back blocked by a floating bandaged figure. He falls down a hole instead, and back in reality, the guards note Malcolm actually cut his own throat. Rid of his physical body, the spirit of Malcolm floats freely outside of time forever, and while he is freed of his original destiny, he is now bound to serving fate in an eternal loop as the caretaker. The next day, it's July 28th, as the caretaker appears before Theo, telling him he may not have been able to save Janine, but he can still save himself. He reveals Janine succumbed to the possession of John Defoe, as when Theo chose to comfort her, he was lowering the guard of her fragile mind too. He adds that Theo actually has a dark future ahead of him, and the way out of here is through the basement of Defoe Manor. As Theo is concerned about the madman lurking within, the caretaker assures him there are enough Trilby clones to provide a safe escort. However, once there, he needs to break down Defoe's mental defenses and defeat Defoe by becoming Defoe. Wishing him well, as this will be the final time they see each other, Theo at least wishes to know who he is. The caretaker shares he was once a man like him, but now, like him, he is also a slave to fate and pawn to a game larger than they can comprehend. Before disappearing, he mentions that even pawns can become something greater when they make it across the board. Shuffling back to the hub, the hallway is now converted to Defoe's influence, and with a trio of trilbies, Theo enters the hub one last time. As he picks up the welding mask, leather apron, and machete, his escort falls to the prince one by one. Donning the complete outfit, he enters the basement, and immediately things go dark as he slowly descends and sees every poor and unfortunate soul wrapped up in the Chizo mythos. Outside, the caretaker notes there was one last Trilby clone left, and begins guiding this one towards its destined path of burning the house down. As Theo wakes up, he reaches out into the darkness, feels something metal, and pushing against it, he finds himself crawling out of the box aboard the Mephistopheles. The caretaker speaks out to him that this is not real, and Theo now finds himself in the Defoe basement again, seeing the tall man leave quickly, and reads the true plans of the order he left behind. The destruction of the mind of Defoe had to occur in the exact middle between the destruction of the body in the past and the soul in the future, and with all three destroyed, a bridge would open, allowing Chizou into the world. Looking under the tarp, Theo is shocked to find someone set him up a bomb, powerful enough to vaporize the entire building, and he realizes this past week everyone down here was set up as a sacrifice. Strangely though, the bomb has just been disarmed, and wonders if this was the work of the tall man just now. Trying to leave, he is suddenly met by the fire the final Trilby clone started with the caretaker, and with nowhere left to flee, the nano-explosive bomb detonates, easily annihilating the ophthalmology building and its underground complex. Six more days passed, and as the explosion has been observed by the entire world, no pain elemental has crossed over. Overlooking the resulting crater, the caretaker notes he is only an observer to these events for the most part, and remarks that he wonders why the Order expected a creature from the world of magic will cross over into a world of technology in the first place where no magic exists for it to survive on. As it turns out, the prophecies were all wrong, and Freehorn, the Order, and even the Tall Man were just being misled by the pain elemental itself, as the bridge was indeed opened, but nothing chose to come through. He wonders then if Chizo was planning to take something rather than send something, but regardless, he must do his task and guide those, including himself in 200 years, on their fate in this eternal loop. As the game ends, we see Jack Freehorn write the three books of Chizo, filled with the prophecies of the Prince, the Victims, and the Bridge. However, unknown to all, including the Prince, was that there was a fourth book tossed out by Jack, as it seemed to contradict the other prophecies called the Book of the New Prince. Within, it shared a new revelation, as we now see the tattered body of Theo before Chizo, as the Pain Elemental used the open bridge to take Theo from that world. As the Prince would enter, Chizo was upset at his betrayal of sabotaging the bomb, and for this he stripped from him his power as the Prince, returning him to his form as Kabadath. He cries out he knew Chizo intended to replace him as the Prince, as this was the true purpose of the bridge, and did what he did in order to continue serving as that role. Scolding him for his arrogance, Chizo imbues Theo with his power anyway, transforming him into a bandaged new body of power called the New Prince. As Kabadath still wonders why he is being punished, Chizo replies he was first offered to be the bridge, and against Chizo's will, he made John Defoe the bridge so that he may stay the prince, and continue to meddle with others to maintain this role. Allowed one last chance to stay if he can defeat the New Prince, the arrogant man is easily thrown aside and as he moves closer, the new prince sees the final trilby has also been brought here as well to feed Chizo. Cementing his new role, the new prince stands firm in fulfilling the true ending of the Chizo mythos prophecy. 
Six Days of Sacrifice is free, so go download it, enjoy, and donate to the creator worldwide.